talking about the most used words, <laughs> certainly this year, and that is, guess what they are? Artificial intelligence. AI, 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 artificial intelligence. So it's part of our lives, whether we're aware of it or not. But how does it really impact our lives? And for you watching this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are, how does it really impact your life? And what do you need to know? So because it is such a hot topic, I have invited the founder, co-founder and CEO of Rad AI, Jeremy Bonnet, to join us to help unpack this all. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Nadia. It's a pleasure to be here. Such a pleasure to have you and AI. So for people who are watching, who are going, it's mystifying. What do I need to know? Let's first of all start off by talking about how it is already in our lives. Well, artificial intelligence has uh, been a part of a lot of people's lives, not just this last year, I would say probably close to the last seven or eight years even. Uh, I mean, things like Siri, uh, recommendations on the types of places you go to, uh, the ads that you see when you're surfing online, uh, the ads that you engage with, um, uh, guiding and uh, showing what new ads come in front of you. Uh, there's a whole world uh, that's going on behind the scenes digitally. I think what's happened recently is there's a commercialization associated with a lot of bigger, more notable brands, uh, some recent IPOs like the Reddit IPO, uh, a lot of noise around what recently happened with NVIDIA that's capturing the imaginations of a lot of people. Then uh, over the last 24 months, everything that's happened with chat GPT and the usability and the ease of usability has really put AI at the forefront in everybody's minds. So for us, for people who are watching today and you want to be competitive, so whatever organization you're in, what mm. do businesses need to know if they're going to be competitive? Because famously it's adapt or die. If we don't keep up with the trends and do what organizations who are doing this well are doing. So in other words, what is the commercial viability of AI and what does every business need to know if they are going to continue to thrive and survive going into the future? Well, I think it's a really good question, Nadia. I think the, the, the thing that is really important for any business or any company that's in the AI space is uh, without a problem, AI doesn't really matter. So there's always a specific problem that you're solving associated with the use case. So in the context of Rad AI, our company, uh, we are solving the problem of creative strategy and the concepts that are used that are used in order to guide content recommendations. And the benefit for a brand in that context is they're making better decisions. They're not alienating. Uh, potential customers, they're enhancing the experiences that their existing customer base has with their products. And this kind of bleeds into several different things. But when you talk about artificial intelligence, it's almost like this opaque thing, like saying the internet, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Uh, but having artificial intelligence without it being focused on a specific problem that you're trying to solve is essentially worthless. So the way artificial intelligence works in the context of commercial use cases is most typically you have different sources of data that are used to train large language models, uh, which you'll kind of hear them referred to as LLMs out there in the, in the world, depending on how technical you are or aren't. But these data sets are used as sources to train recommendations of what you should or shouldn't do. And the important component here is the user of the AI is still in charge and empowered to make final decisions. So we think of AI as a way to make your job better, but it's not something that's going to replace. It's always something that augments and makes it better. And that's another, I think, widespread misconception of what AI is or isn't. Um, our strong opinion is the people that 
are going to get left behind in this next wave of technology adoption are the people that don't learn about AI and understand how to make their jobs better. I think, like, for example, you're a journalist. Think about Steven Spielberg as a director of movies. The power of AI in his hands means that he can make three or four films over a five-year time frame versus one film over a five-year time frame. So it makes people that are really good at what they do even better. You know, it's so interesting. There's so many things I want to talk to you about um, in terms of the mystique around AI and a certain fear. And I think what you're saying to all organizations is hire people who really understand it. And I'm going back to Rad AI as, as an organization that can help you and a company who can help you really understand it because your competitor is. And that's the point, isn't it, Jeremy? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a competitive environment. And, you know, from a commerciality, from a commercial viability perspective, we're always thinking about it in terms of our product and understanding the market and understanding how enterprises are adopting. And just because you have this wonderful product and you think that it's really great and it's going to do all these things, you have to remember that uh, with enterprise adoption, we're talking about, you know, the Fortune 1000s that are out there. They're still new and they're still learning and they're still understanding and and safety around data is really important. Uh, bias associated with how these recommendations are coming in is also really important, especially with today's modern audience and the framework associated with all the things you can do and can't do and can say and can't say and, and all of that noise. So from the way we think about it is number one, just simplifying the landscape and uh, our adoption curve with enterprises has been a lot of training, a lot of understanding, a lot of safety around data and making certain that the recommendations are trusted, right? And, and the way you accomplish trusted recommendations is by just teaching and showing and creating an open environment, which is transparent so people can raise their hand and learn. And that's really where we're at right now. It's still very, very early. And, uh, and it's not just the practitioners that are on the front lines that are adopting AI. It's going all the way up and down the food chain of the organization, all the way up to C-suite and boardroom. So you have to really think about it from a broader adoption curve. And everything starts with education from our perspective. So it's taking a moment, showing the breadcrumbs that have fed into why we're making the recommendations and having the infrastructure to support safety. Those are really, really important when you talk about wider adoption. So a couple of things I want to touch on. You spoke about safety and data protection. So for example, with the TikTok app, mm -hmm. there's been great concern over safety of data. And the latest news is, is it going to be banned? Uh, what are the laws around it? You and I have had many discussions about TikTok as safety, and I'd love your thoughts on TikTok. And then there are a couple of things I want to ask you about companies that have gone wrong in not doing the kind of work that you do to identify the right audience. But seeing you spoke about safety, can mm -hmm. we touch on TikTok for a moment? Well, I, you, I started to smile when you were talking about TikTok because my 11-year-old daughter has a parent-supervised account that has 28,000 followers on TikTok. So she's a, a, a TikTok. She's an influencer. She's an influencer, yeah. And, um, you know, and, and when I think about TikTok, and, and by the way, there's been this type of uh, witch hunt has had different different ways that it's manifested over the years. There was something with, with Facebook and whether you agree or don't agree. And, you know, the, there was also something with Google a few years ago, whether you agree but or they don't. weren't owned by China. That's the yes, point. They, they, weren't the owned by, management. They, they weren't owned by China. Um, what I can tell you is these things have a tendency to get a lot of steam really quickly and people figure it out. Um, the actual end result is out of everybody's control. Uh, but I would be willing to bet a, a dollar that they will figure it out, a way for it to be compliant and there's too big of an economy that's on TikTok right now. Um, we're talking about billions of dollars worth of infrastructure that is all supporting U.S.-based economy. You have a creator economy. You have brands. 
You have people that are interacting with brands on TikTok. You literally have billions of dollars of media that's exchanged on the platform. Um, and this is all driven by the biggest market in the world, which is the USA. Um, so, you know, you have something that the people in America really, really want. So unfortunately, these types of things, they get politicized. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's an election year going on right now. But what I can tell you is I've seen this manifest in several different ways, in several different lifestyles, and excuse me, in several different styles and several different communication points. It always ends up that the powers that be figure out a way to make it work. Um, if it gets acquired by a U.S.-based company, so be it. Maybe they figure out another way to do it. Uh, but I can tell you, we're we're partners. We're one of 21 partners with TikTok. Uh, Rad Rad AI is, and um, they're more compliant and worried about data than anybody because of the heavy level of scrutiny. So our experience with TikTok has been it's a company that really cares about the user experience. It really cares. They seem to be a company that really cares about protecting the rights of the users that are on the platform, and they're very conscious of the fact that data is a big worry um my opinion on it whether you know take it for what it's worth is it's just a political you know it's it's some sort of politicized environment that's getting put in front of everybody and um they will figure it out so that that's my opinion on take on TikTok, and i'd be very surprised if TikTok ceased to exist in the united states of america over the well, next six months i was thinking instead of betting a dollar why don't we bet maybe your nvidia stock no, not, joking. Nvidia <laughs> stock is not up for grabs. Not yeah. happening, Jeremy. Another thing, and you know, again, we're touching on many topics today, and hopefully, this will be the first of many conversations. But for the purposes of time, because we don't have too much longer, but I wanted to talk to you about red, red AI. Your AI helps mm. organizations, companies, brands identify their target market, and I couldn't help thinking about. And I hope it's okay that I raise this and tell me if it's not the whole Bud Light fiasco. So here it happens is Bud Light, very well-known brand, brings in an influencer, causes a backlash. Would that be something that your artificial intelligence would prevent? Yeah, that, that would be precisely. So a lot of times it's avoiding uh, communication disasters. Uh, I think the Bud Light fiasco is a really good example of what you shouldn't do. And, uh, you know, th and this is what happens when a brand wants to get their product in front of a new audience and doesn't take into consideration these existing dynamics that are out there with existing audiences. And then what ends up happening is they not only um, upset their existing customer base, but they also accept the customer base that they were trying to attract. So it, this is one of those instances where a double negative does not equal a positive. So you have those types of instances that happen a lot. And this isn't just like isolated with Bud Light. And I think that's a very popular example because of uh, because of the sign of the times, right? But this also happens in instances that are really good as well. And a lot of times that is something that we just see and we don't realize the thought and energy that went into it. I can give you an example of one of our clients, uh, Skechers. And if you look at what they did uh, for their Super Bowl ad, they had Tony Romo and Mr. T in the Super Bowl ad for these slip-on Skechers, which right away when you watch this ad, you're like, okay, there's not one Gen Z in the world who's wearing these slip-ons, right? <laughs> they're, they're for people that like me that are a little too lazy to put on their shoes. And most Gen Zs, by the way, don't know who Mr. T is. And it's very rare that they're going to know who Tony Romo is. Now, I grew up watching both of these people. So it's not a coincidence that that was one of the best ads during the Super Bowl. And they've continued running it. And they've had a nice uptick as a result of that. But that idea comes from somewhere. The use of those personalities comes from somewhere. The topics associated with what those personalities are going to put into the market, into the ethos, all of that comes from somewhere. So my point is, is there's a lot of times that this happens when it's bad. And when it's bad, it gets way more exaggerated. And there's also uh, a lot of times where the information is good that guides what you should or shouldn't do. And look, you know that like bad strategy equals bad results over here. It doesn't matter how good of a marketer or a marketing strategist uh, or, or a, market, uh, a marketing practitioner you are. 
if you're wrong with what you should do over here, it's going to be very hard to have success once you produce and push out your product. Mm -hmm. That's very well articulated. And Jeremy, I'm hoping this is the first of many conversations because the reality is, as you said, AI is part of our lives and it's understanding both on a micro level and a macro level, how does one understand it, incorporate it and use it. But I will say this, and I've said it many times, in a world of artificial intelligence, there is no substitute for genuine connection and for what we've just done, which is have a real conversation. So unless there is going to be an avatar of Jeremy and Nadia, could we really fabricate this kind of interaction? And is AI capable of doing that? These are wonderful questions. I think you touched on a point that I always make. The value of human EQ with really, really good AI helping you dial in where and how you want to focus your conversation points is even more powerful. And I always like AI does not make a great creative program. AI can make somebody who's really creative even better and faster. But the value of human interaction, I think even has more of a premium on it today because of the, well, there's concerns about the lack of human interaction. So now the value of human interaction has gone up, right? And then also just the idea of like, we can as humans use better sources of information to make us better at the things that we already do, right? So I think it's a really, really interesting point, but you and I still need to get on to this screen share and have this fun conversation in order for your audience to enjoy it our avatars would not be successful in this context. But what could we be doing, you and I, right now? What artificial intelligence could boost this interaction and make this live stream a better experience for our audience? Should we try that next time? We could try that next time. I mean, I, I could also tell you what that would be. Please. Uh, but the, the way to think about that, and this is actually, this would be a fun fun, quick little exercise that we can go through offline, but uh, for your audience that would be curious, is our technology could analyze the audience interactions associated with all of your social channels and could tell us going into it, the things that your audience cares most about. And then we could communicate with each other prior to the conversation about those things and we could come up with some talking points specific to the things that your audience wants to hear most. Our EQ is still being used. Our interaction vibe is still really critical, but we're just more educated going into the conversation about the things your audience cares most about. So to every podcaster out there, to every journalist out there, to every news outlet out there, to every product and every brand, what Jeremy is telling us, the work of Rad AI, is to help understand what you, the audience, need and to make sure that we are giving you that. Jeremy Bonnet, nice this week. has been a very insightful conversation. And yes, next time, who knows what we might be talking about, Jeremy, because we're going to find out what you, the audience, wants and needs to know more about and we'll be bringing you that so i'm nadia vilchik my website is nadiaspeaks.com if you want to know more about jeremy barnett if you want to know what rad ai can do for you jeremy best way to reach you email is good jeremy barnett at radintel.ai jeremy barnett at rad i'm going to write that down jeremy so it's jeremy spelt barnett i want to make sure everybody has this at radintel.ai and you can find him on LinkedIn as well I do assure you I want to make sure that everybody has that Jeremy Bonnet at Rad Intel AI thank you for having a genuine conversation about an artificial intelligence thanks Jeremy